Yo, this episode of Bass Freaks is brought to you by Dunlop Super Bright Bass Strings. Dunlop Super Bright Bass Strings put your sound front and center with a bright yet musical top end, balanced fundamental, and a warm low end. Designed from the ground up to fit the vision of what a string should be, Super Bright Bass Strings provide a superior response that allows the natural voice of your bass to come through. Made in California at Dunlop Headquarters, go to jimdunlop.com and check out Super Bright Bass Strings. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Dunlop Presents Bass Freaks. This is the place for all us bass freaks to chat it up and gain a little insight and inspiration and hopefully have some fun. I'm your host, Josh Paul. And today on the show, we welcome a bassist, producer, constructor of, I would say, brutalist tones and all around cool dude, Adam Nolly Get Good. Thank you so much for being here, man. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Really, really happy to be on. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, it's a bit of a crazy time. We're in the process of moving house and everything in the UK is kind of starting up a little bit again after COVID. Oh, have you managed to stay healthy? I have. Yeah, really luckily I have. And my family stayed healthy as well. Kind of work from home or whatever. So yeah, I've been really lucky and we're grateful about that. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome, How about yourself? Uh, I did have COVID. Right. Um, and I was so careful, like for almost... The entire year of whenever, you know, from when everything started, uh, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm so, I'm grateful. I'm so healthy. I went to go do a session and I came back and I got sick. I could breathe, but it was just like, uh, just not a good, not a good thing. Cause that thing kicked my ass. Anyway, <laughs> dude, I'm so, again, I'm so happy and thankful that you're doing this because I'm a huge fan, not only of your work with uh, Periphery, but dude, you are making some crazy, crazy, crazy tones and sounds. I mean, uh, tell us about this pedal that you have out. Oh, sure, man. Thanks for saying that. That's really, really cool. And it's cool to know you've been following, uh, following Definitely. Periphery. Uh, so yeah, we, we launched this pedal called the Dark Glass Adam, which uh, has an anemic, uh, anemic, whatever you say. Uh, it's, it's supposed to stand for Aggressively Distorted Advanced Machine. Um, and essentially, it's it's a really high-tech stomp box that replicates like a studio heavy music bass rig. So as you know, it's really common, even live too, to kind of have several signals. If you want a distorted bass signal, it tends to not be like you just distort your whole bass signal. It tends to get really kind of farty and horrible sounding. But it's really <laughs> normal to like kind of distort one one side of your bass signal and then keep a clean side as well and blend them. Um, right. And Dark Glass have done this before with their X series pedals, but this this is a similar concept, but based around my recording chains that I've used for a while. And it's got some extra stuff going on on the back end to just make it come out sounding really like final and, and solid. How did you come up with this? I mean, how did this come about? I should probably start by saying I've known Doug from Dark Glass from the very early days. I met him in Finland uh, probably about a decade ago now when he, he was recently moved there or within a couple of years from Chile. And he was hand making his pedals. Um, and I'd heard his pedals in the hands of a bassist called Tor from the band Shining. I don't think he plays with them anymore. Um, and he sounded so amazing. I asked him what the pedal was. He said, Dark Glass Electronics. Long story short, managed to make contact with Doug and we met up. And I was just like, I was pretty new to the bass playing thing. I was, I'd gone and done a degree in guitar. I thought guitar was going to be my focus. And then I joined Periphery as a bassist. Um, How long ago was that? That's about 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah, they brought me in to, to kind of co-produce the second full-length record they did. And around that time, lost their bassist. So there was an opening there. Um, Got it. And they asked me if I'd join. And I am denied about it because I kind of thought I was going to do like guitar. Um, ah. But I actually really enjoyed playing bass on the record. that Because they didn't have a bassist, um, I'd kind of taken up the role of playing bass on the record so the guitarists could just do their thing. And I was... I was still kind of figuring it out by feel, but I, I enjoyed it. I really enjoy the the precision involved in playing bass really well. You know, like the consistency, the timing, the tuning, just being really like solid, which is 
to me how like rock metal bass should be it should just be like really monolithic and solid well that's one of the things i was going to say about your stuff is that it's so heavy and, and sort of relentless but it's it's clean at the same time oh, that's cool. it's really so. precise and clean so it's very cool oh that's awesome man it, it, yeah those are pretty much dream descriptors that i would love to hear about what i do so thanks so much for saying that that's awesome well, um yeah no and i really enjoy that about playing bass and then live i love the feeling you know when you've got those frequencies around and i like guitar can be a bit fiddly sometimes like it can be pretty fiddly just sitting sitting and playing it but live especially with the adrenaline going and like in heavy music sometimes you want to move around and so much of the time with guitar you like need to stay a bit more especially with periphery anyway like you need to stay really still and play everything really carefully and it's not quite the same expression of the energy that you're feeling uh, that bass can be i hear that you have to have the girth i love the girth of the bass yeah, just feeling those vibrations and um ah uh, yes i just love it yeah me too <laughs> so man. you started off on guitar yeah um how did you transition over and how do you, were there any bass players that you sort of uh, looked up to at all? Yeah, there were. I, I think the, the, to be honest, bass hadn't like caught my ear all that much, but there were a few basses that did. And I thought like, damn, that's awesome. Like that's the kind of bass that I like before I was a bassist, you know? Um, okay. I think probably two come to mind and that is the bass is called James Leach from a band called Sixth, who are incredibly influential for me. They're probably one of the most important bands that I I found out about and started listening to. Um, and James does a lot of slapping and popping um, really creatively within a very complex kind of mathy metal setting uh, and tapping very as cool. well and creates okay. very interesting parts as a bassist. So that caught my ear. And then the other one would probably be John Stockman from Carnival. Oh, and, okay. You know, when are you familiar with, with Carnival I as am. a band? Yeah, yeah. There's that record called Sound Awake, which came out quite a few years ago now. You know, <laughs> Excuse me. I just swallowed a ton of coffee. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you got me excited talking about that. <laughs> oh, wicked. I mean, so I think John Stockman's bass tone, and I mean, he's a really creative part writer. And the band that he's in is not, it is progressive music, but it's not progressive metal in the way the guitars work. Like in Periphery, the guitars are kind of one solid mass, all playing the same thing riff wise. And the bass tends to just mirror that an octave down, which can be yeah. tricky. And that's part of the challenge. With, uh, with Carnival, John is holding down the riffs quite a lot of the time and the guitars are off doing spacey ambient things. Um, so he stands out within the ensemble but the bass tones on that record in particular are so huge um, oh yeah and really just really distorted but clean but precise but clanky and and different on every song too which is kind of cool um and i mean i think probably 50 percent of it is the producer that worked on that record who's an amazing producer called forrester savile um, ah, and then 50 percent okay. is maybe john i know john's really experimental with what he does with his bass rigs I think the combination of those two really set up like the kinds of ideas of like playing consistency and cool parts, um, not overstepping and great tone and how important that like great bass tone, especially within like Carnival's context with like how many people liked that band because of the bass tone, you know, without even realizing yeah. it, you know? Yeah. Um, um, as far as playing goes, do you prefer, uh, following guitar? I know it depends on, you know, every situation, but are you able to, or do you love to create lines or just follow the guitars a lot of the times? I know with that band, you said you do follow the guitar lines, which yeah. is awesome. And, and, um, but do you like to get a little creative or ex experimental? I think there's, there's a time and a place for each and probably in periphery, um, when I was in the band, it's probably like 80% following and 20% doing other stuff. But within the context of periphery, it is really satisfying following what the guitars do because it's kind of designed for a sonic effect of like this huge lump of guitar and bass. <laughs> and like where you almost just get that octaver effect where your bass uh, feels yeah. like it's just reinforcing the riff in the most glorious way. 
And it's very satisfying to be a part of that unison. So, so I really do enjoy it in that context. Awesome. That is awesome. So when you back to your um, tones mm -hmm. and um, pedal, how are you, what is your approach and what are you looking for in finding that perfect tone? Yeah, for you. cool. I went on a huge, huge kind of side <laughs> side conversation. There. No, no, no. So I, I love it. I, I love it. Yeah. Meeting Doug. So, um, yeah, essentially, like I was saying before, that it's very difficult to get a kind of all in one sound. As you probably know, if you want a distorted bass sound, it's very difficult to just you don't just take a clean amp and put a distortion pedal in front of it, a typical old school kind of stomp box. And, and you're there because you tend to lose all of the low end. Um, so, you know, the way that I've gone about creating bass tones is quite similar to how a lot of people in, in modern rock and metal do, which is to kind of blend sometimes a kind of high gain guitar amp style distortion, um, uh -huh. with a cleaner DI, sometimes even taking all of the upper frequencies out of the clean DI. So it just sounds like sub, just like, you know what I mean? Like yeah, just fundamental yeah. note, um, and blending the two together and then it, if you do it right, and it takes a bit of experimentation and trial and error and luck sometimes, you get <laughs> to where when you combine it, it doesn't actually sound like um, like separate things, if that makes sense. You know, it sounds like one cohesive tone. So that's the goal. Um, and it is tricky, I think, because of the nature of trying to, to nail these kinds of tones. Um, I always found it honestly quite stressful it's funny as someone who works as a producer and who plays a bass you'd think the bass would be like my like the the easiest part of producing and, and engineering tones but actually i've always found bass quite difficult because of the role of the low end in the mix and mm. how if it's not right and it's not consistent the whole band sounds really just flat and loses power or you know, if the distortion's too scrapey or something, it can be really unpleasant. Um, <laughs> so, you know, over time, I, I kind of had these signal chains that I developed and developed. And that's when this really long relationship I'd had with, with Doug from Dark Glass and kind of him doing all these incredible projects with John Stockman from Carnival, among other, other bassists, and generating these amazing distortion types. It kind of got to the point where I felt really solid with my kind of bass tone and how to create it. And technology had come such a long way. And what Dark Glass was doing in terms of, you know, using digital processing and the, the touch controls they had and the kind of MIDI capabilities and all these things had come such a long way that it was like, we've been saying for years we should collaborate on something. And it was like the time was right. It aligned where I, I felt like I'd really honed the tone. And he came to me with like, well, you know, if you want to do this, we could we could do it far more than just like a simple you know, signature sound where you just press a button and it's your sound and there's no options, we can actually offer the user loads of options. So we ended up giving them multiple distortion types, multiple cabinet types, uh, multiple compression modes. So it's like, it's actually a real Swiss army knife of a pedal. Um, but it's I mean, awesome. I, I hate to make this into too much of an ad for the pedal, but it genuinely is awesome. Yeah. It sits here on the desk. It's probably out of shot for you, but it's right here. I've used it on absolutely everything, including loads of client work. Um, I play ding wall basses pretty much exclusively. Okay. Um, uh, f five, six string, four string. I love a four string. I love a four string. It's so I do too. small and fun, like in terms of the neck width. Um, yeah. I think often with periphery, the five string was more necessary. Um, okay. But I think even active or passive. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Go ahead. Um, you're asking active or passive. So yes, I, I'm easy. Actually, a long time ago, when we designed the, the Dingwall signature model, which is the bass that I play, mm -hmm. um, we wanted to have a special um, preamp built into it. And this actually was a collaboration with Dark Glass. They wanted to do a preamp. So I collaborated with the guys at Dark Glass to create what's called the Tone Capsule, which is a three-band EQ preamp section, um, which we have in, in all of my basses and also gets sold separately by Dark Glass. So that's in the the basis and it sounds really great you can get very aggressive sounds you can get really huge sounds out of that preamp um coming from the guitar world i also like to keep it simple sometimes so i kind of alternate 
I, the thought for me of like moving the knobs a little bit on the preamp and losing my tone is a little bit scary sometimes. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes I just prefer Hopefully to that it. doesn't happen. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen, but yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you've got it dialed in just right and then you're like, oh no, wait a minute. I've nudged it now yeah. and I can't get it back. You know, I've seen bases with just the one knob and, or even just like a switch. And I wish that I could do that, but I just... I can't commit to that. Right. <laughs> it's like one trick pony. How does being a bass player affect um, your production style? Um, I think, I think the insight into how a bass tone can work and like understanding what the bass tone can do sonically when it's got a certain tone that marries up with a certain kind of guitar tone has been really, really good for me. And I think you listen to certain rock and metal mixes, especially going back a decade or more. And the bass guitar can be really just relegated to this kind of round sine wave sounding thing or not be very audible. Um, more of a feeling. Yeah. Of, yeah. Which is cool. And certainly like, I think there's certain realms of music where that's totally fine and you don't want to have a clanky bass sound, even within like rock maybe more of a kind of arena rock kind of thing. You don't necessarily want the bass to be super audible and kind of taking people's heads off. But yeah. I do take a lot of pleasure as like a mixing engineer and a producer in making the bass really audible and at the same time part of the of the unit. Um, I apologize, by the way, if you can hear a manically barking dog in the background. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> dogs are dogs are cool. Dogs are cool. Yeah, yeah ours is <laughs> mental, so she, she barks at Just once. She just wants to get in on the interview. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> She's probably barking well, at someone outside the house, like watching the people what, on the street. <laughs> what kind of dog is it? She's a little sausage dog. Like a, oh. a mini, a wiener dog, as you guys would call them. Daxon. Wiener dog. Yeah. <laughs> She's sausage dog. I like that. <laughs> um, what elements do you think are uh, mandatory to be able to cut through a mix? in a bass tone. Yeah, I think I think one of the trickiest things is controlling dynamics, by which I mean like, especially if you've got like a pick player or a hard finger player, you get these really big spikes on every attack and then yeah. the note really dies away. It's not the, that the instrument doesn't have sustain, it's just got so much potential for that initial like strike to just pop right out and really catch people's ears and it tends to make people want to kind of turn the bass down if they don't do something to control it. So I actually think that compression of bass is really important because compression can kind of even that out so that then the sustained note of the bass is a lot more audible. And then you can turn it up a bit in the mix. Because otherwise, if you just got like a really hammering attack on your bass, yeah. you, you're turning it up to try and hear the note, but all you're getting is just like really flappy, like annoying attack on the bass <laughs> and that doesn't sit well especially with distorted guitars which if you see them are like dynamically completely flat like they don't have right. any attack on them right um so i think compression is really interesting the way that i go about it additionally to that is distortion because distortion does a similar thing and gives you like really brings out the mid-range like the harmonics which uh -huh. i think is a beautiful sound and makes the bass like the timbre of the actual instrument very audible through the mix but some players don't like distortion, even within heavy music. And I think in those cases, if I was going to be behind the mixing board and, and I have mixed albums with very clean bass sounds, I compress the hell out of them so that so that it's audible. I just want to hear yeah. the bass rather than just hear it like popping out for an attack and then disappearing. Well, so, so you're a bass player, uh, a bass player's dream as yeah. a producer, basically. Yes, we like to be heard. Yeah, I think scream it out loud. Heard, I want to hear the bass. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, what uh, what picks do you use and why? I use really thin um, Dunlop Tortex uh, 60 mil regular picks. The thin ones, huh? Yeah. So these would be like the equivalent of the orange regular Tortex picks. Um, okay. And this is something I discovered really early on because of two things. One, I found really heavy picks were just fatiguing. If you're playing with a very aggressive like picking hand the heavy pick really like you feel that impact back through your fingers in your arm and it's just unpleasant and if you're trying to play quickly sometimes it feels like you just can't get the pick through the string to get like the alternate nice and quickly 
Um, and then secondly, the, the, the really nice thing with a soft pick is it kind of controls your dynamics again. So that if you pick a bit harder, it flexes a bit more. So it doesn't come out like, you know, if you pick double as hard, it doesn't come out double as loud. It kind of compresses it a bit. And then if you're picking lightly, it doesn't flex as much and you still get quite a good attack off the string. And what I found is it's good both from kind of flattering my playing technique, but also moving across like on a five string bass when you've got a really thick cable of a fifth string, it can come out really loud in comparison to the top string unless you kind of play dynamically. And you're always going to need to do that a little bit, maybe like, you know, have to pick harder on certain strings than other ones to make it come out sounding even. But with a light pick, it kind of does some of that work for you. And yeah, it's just not fatiguing on your on your arm. You can really lay into the bass and you get that like slight kind of cello-y kind of attack where the pick kind of thups a little bit as it goes past the string, you know, as it kind of bends and then flicks over the string. Um, and I really that. like that. How did you uh, uh, come to that decision? I mean, did you go through just a bunch of different picks and um, gauges and... How did you arrive to that? Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, obviously, as a guitar player, I was really familiar with different picks and what you do. But I remember right, being okay. like, okay, I'm going to play bass. What do bass players use? And someone just gave me like a a big stubby, you know, like these these big old purple stubby Dunlop picks. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and they were like, yeah, bass players use these. And I tried it and it just it didn't work for me. Like it it got really serrated really quickly from like, you know, the 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 wines on the strings. Uh -huh. um, and I just didn't, it felt like it was giving a lot of kind of bit too much feedback into my arm. Like I had to grip it really hard. And I actually used to break strings. The first tour I ever did with Periphery, I borrowed a bass and I kept breaking the low string on it because I wanted to go wild on stage. And I was <laughs> picking it with a stubby and it would just snap the string. It was crazy. You're um, breaking E string? A low yeah. string? Yeah, well, yeah, really? lower than that, the the like the fifth string, so like a, a B or often tuned down to like an A flat or something like that. Ah, uh, I was just breaking wow. them, and it sucked because bass strings are expensive. <laughs> yes, they are. Yes, they are. What uh, what strings do you use? Um, so I typically use the Dingwall own branded strings. Um, because of the basses I play, they've got a really long scale length on the on the lowest string, um, and that at least when I started playing bass, it was really difficult to find anything apart from like specially made strings that would accommodate that 37 inch scale. But I do believe that Dunlop make really long scale strings now that are suitable for, for up to those kind of scale lengths. So, you know, it is a little bit limiting having only the kind of stock gauges that, that Ding will make. I really like the strings, but maybe it would be worth seeing what, what Dunlop is doing now with the, uh, the longer scale strings. I think you should. Yeah. I use them. I, I, I love them. Oh, that's awesome. Do you do you go for stainless or, or nickel strings normally? I well, I like both. Um I've been rocking the super brights recently. Yeah. Um I think if I'm not mistaken, I think Dunlop does make strings for Dingwalls as well. Yeah, I think it's a recent so, thing. And it is, I'm only just remembering yeah. now that I think I saw an ad for it or something or somebody talking about it. So Dude, you should check them out. Yeah. For sure. We know somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so let's talk about expand uh expanding career opportunities for bassists because i know you're doing so many different things cool. um i i think that especially now with this pandemic for us musicians and touring musicians especially um it's really important to branch out and you seem to have been doing that as well do you want to talk about that a little bit sure yeah i think well, it's funny, isn't it? Like, if you think about it, bassists quite frequently are the ones in a band that has other stuff going on. I don't know if you've noticed this, but like, I know quite a lot of managers who used to be bassists. Oh, yeah. I've noticed that. Yeah. Um, and actually a lot of famous record producers are bassists as well. That's true. Like, quite a lot of them. I think I think it's actually, yeah. So I think, I think, I don't know exactly why it is, but yeah, it's always worth having... You're being open to alternative routes in the industry. You know, it's very difficult to just have one goal, stay fixated on it and achieve it, I think, because, you know, life throws all sorts of things in your way, like a pandemic, which is something that we're all experiencing. But, you know, people go through their own individual trials 
and unexpected life changes every day, regardless of that. And opportunities come up. And I think, uh, you know, I'm not saying you should just say yes to absolutely everything that comes your way. But I think even if stuff doesn't necessarily totally align with what you what you think is the route towards your goal, it's worth exploring it. Like, I mean, for me, just even becoming a bassist was it was a leap of faith in a way. I'd, I'd dedicated a lot of time and money into guitar thinking that I was going to become the lead guitarist in the band and I was going to tour as a guitarist. And, you know, my gut reaction when the periphery first asked me if I'd consider joining full time as a bassist was like, ah, but I've got, I kind of want to do my own thing. And then thinking about it, it was like, you know what? I actually do enjoy playing bass. Like if you just remove that preconception out of your head of where you thought life was going to go, you go like, actually, you know what? I'm really enjoying this. And I mean, in periphery, there's three guitarists. Let's say one day I have an opportunity to be one of those three guitarists. There's still going to be two other guitarists in the band, and there's nothing wrong with that. But bass does offer a kind of unique thing within, like, kind of between guitar and bass. There's typically only one bassist in a band. There's a chance <laughs> to kind of inhabit your own space, define your own space, um, you know, do something which is you're not sharing the spotlight with anyone which, you know, is important if you're looking for a long career in music. Like, it's important to be able to stand out in your own way. I don't necessarily mean in an attention-grabbing way, but to be able to define your your space and, and for people to recognize what you do. And, you know, those were the points that convinced me that it was worth trying, and it turned out to be an amazing decision for me. Um, and, yeah, then from there, like you were, we were talking about before, having the opportunity to understand bass better as an instrument and the sounds that you can get out of the instrument really helped me when I got into record production, which was another bit of a left field turn for me where it was like, I thought I was going to be in a touring band and kind of, I, and I was, but then there was yeah. this opportunity and I was like, but I'm really loving the studio side of things, but this is crazy. Like, you know, Periphery is doing really well. We're playing in front of upwards of a thousand people a night, um, touring internationally. This is really cool. But I want to do this other thing. And I kind of my heart told me that actually that's kind of where I wanted to go instead. Um, and then let's that, talk about the transition from periphery like, to that. Yeah. So from from, you know, you're out there touring and you're you're uh, basically, you know, being a rock star, you In know, doing that. I, I hate that word, but, you know, out there doing the thing. And and when was that day that you just said, you know what, I think I think that I just need to do this? I think, you know, it took me a little while maybe to come to terms with it. You know, I think, for me at least, if I think back to a lot of major decisions like that in my life, I kind of knew very early, very quickly, when you see the fork in the road, um, yeah. you know, which way you're going to go. And I think often it just takes time to, to come to terms with the fact that that's the, the way you're going to go. I don't know how to describe it other than that, but it's like, you kind of need to, your gut knows where you're going and then your brain, for me, my brain needs to catch up <laughs> and to be like, okay, no, this is what we're doing. Um, but, you know, I, I was, I was really into the production thing. And whenever Periphery recorded, there was a larger role for me each time in the record production process. And then I was on my laptop and I would be recording at the live shows every night, I'd be tuning the drummer's kit every day learning about drum tuning, microphone placement on the kit there, where maybe other engineers would be doing this in a studio, um, doing sessions. I, right. was do I was doing it with what I could. And then we'd be sitting on like, not a tour bus, a bandwagon. Did you ever tour on a bandwagon? Uh, like a van? Well, it's like a converted truck. Okay. So the back uh, of it's kind of like a built out RV kind of thing. It's got a shower gotcha. and a few other you, things. But You know so what, man? <sighs> I was fortunate. Okay. I'm grateful. I, I, my first tour when I was a kid, I was 17 or 18 was with suicidal. Yeah. So I, I got to jump on a bus. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we did do one run in Australia where it was the warp tour or something like that, where each, each band got a few RV type things. Yeah. And that's probably the closest thing to what you're describing. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, that is, I mean, I was lucky too, to be honest. I only did you know, even just within Periphery's development, I skipped most of the really early beginnings where I did one tour as a fill-in where it was like a van tour, but 
after that, I pretty much skipped most of the van touring. They did all of that, and then I got to join <laughs> once they got right. You, you didn't have to sleep under the hotel bed at the Motel Six because oh, there's I mean, no yeah. room on the chair or the sofa or the bed. <laughs> yeah, I, I did that kind of thing just for that one half tour that I filled in for. And yeah, I've got a lot of respect for the bands that, you know, especially in scenes of music where there's never going to be much commercial success and they just love the music and they go out and they tour nonstop doing that for their whole career. That That's really like amazing when, you know, the the level of dedication that some some bands have. Um, but yeah, no, so the point about the, the bandwagon is just got a really loud generator. So I'm there trying to mix on headphones and there's this super loud generator and even if the headphones are blocking some of the noise like everything's vibrating and i mean you can understand as a bassist how difficult it is to listen and make mixing judgments about how the bass guitar should sound when you're surrounded by this kind of throbbing bass no rumble you know? yeah um absolutely so i was kind of making do and it was it was really informative and i learned a lot but it got to a point where i was just like i'm not i'm not going to be able to achieve the quality of work i want to while I'm on tour, you know, in these unpredictable situations on a laptop with headphones. Um, so I think that was building. And then I, then I met my wife. Funnily enough, I met my wife through Doug from Dark Glass much earlier. He was the initial connection because they both came from Chile. Um, oh, cool. But many years later, I met up with her again. And, and, um, and yeah, we ended up getting married. And we were staying in the, in the States. We were in D.C., working on uh the, the what well, was the fourth periphery record but it was called periphery three um and it was just like this is as good a time as any to be like i just want to stay at home my wife had no expectation that that's what i was going to do you know it wasn't one of those things where she was like well you know i don't want to be with someone who's never at home it was just like from my end it was like well okay i've got a, a wife now who i love and i want to spend time with got this studio thing I really want to do. I've been staying a lot in the States because periphery is from the States and I've been, you know, I'm English. So I was away from home, not just for touring, but a lot of the downtime as well. Still living with my parents when I got home because who would rent a place when you're only home for two months out of a year or something like that? Yeah. It's just like, I think there's enough things here. There's en enough catalysts to be like, okay, now's the time to make the change. That's awesome. I mean, you took advantage of all the elements around you. I mean, you learned, like you said, about tuning the drums and, and uh, uh, mixing and all, all at the same time, which mm. is a lot of times, you know, in my experience touring, especially in the beginning, I just went out and I played the shows and I sort of took for granted everything going on around me. Um, you, you traveled a lot, traveled the world, but didn't necessarily go out and see the things that are right in front of you. Um, but I think um, that definitely helped you in your transition to doing so many other things. Yeah, I think it, I think it did. I, I also think there's an element of like, you can't force this stuff. Like, that's just what, like, I don't know, I, I can be pretty obsessive about things. Like in lockdown, <laughs> I've always loved coffee, but in lockdown, there's like the opportunity. Man, like, me too. Yeah, like, I've been going crazy, pulling espresso shots all day long and V60s and buying loads of different coffee beans and trying them all. And, you know, it's become really obsessive to me in a way that I recognize is a little bit similar to how record production was for me at one time, you know, where like <laughs> there's that just that that sh first bit of the learning curve where you learn a lot really quickly is really addictive to me. I love that. I love and I can't necessarily predict what the next thing that's going to be that focus is and sometimes it's something within record production like bass tone or or guitar sounds or a certain mixing thing and i'll just get really obsessed and i mean like you can't see but i'm surrounded by guitar cabs and speakers and stuff because that was an obsession quite recently of just wanting to learn and experiment as much as possible um but i think it's that same that i think that's something which for me, that's been a driving force. I think for other people, it could be something completely unrelated to music. It could be, it could just be about traveling and having life experiences, you know? And it could be that that's the thing which you do. And it, it, maybe it doesn't generate money directly, but it's something which enriches your life and that you feel without needing to think about it, the desire to do or to, to, to make the most of when you're in those situations. So, um, yeah, it's been a big part of my journey, but I don't think 
I could have forced myself to do it another way, you know, without a pressing reason. Maybe if it was like, okay, I've lost every opportunity of making money in, in music for whatever life circumstance, I need to find a new income stream. Maybe then, like just out of pressure, you'd get really obsessed with something else. But right outside of a situation like that, I think it's difficult to just make yourself get obsessed with something new, you know? <laughs> I think it's probably something maybe you're born with as well, you know, the laser focus and yeah. um so you have a some drum packs, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I have a company. I started as a company with the drummer in periphery, Matt Halpin. Okay. Um, we Are you a drummer? To, I love drums okay. and I can play back in black just about. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> No, Congratulations. I, I absolutely love drums. I, I feel like I could talk to most professional drummers and convince them until I got behind a kit that I was a professional drummer. <laughs> I, think, ah. I think I could talk the talk, but I absolutely cannot walk the walk. And I love drums and cymbals and the way they sound. And I collect huge quantities of them and, and record them. But Well, so the relationship between bass and drums is so important. So mm -hmm. you obviously understand um, that relationship and the role yeah. of the drums and the bass working together, yeah. um, you know, it, it, with different genres of music, it could change, but you know, the bass is holding everything down. And, and as long as the, the bass and drums are together, forming that solid rock, people are moving, bouncing their heads. Yeah. Um, do you have any favorite drummers? I mean, Matt from Periphery is really damn good. <laughs> Matt is amazing. Yeah, um, I listened to some of those tones um, from your packs. Oh, and, cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, huge. No, Love them. It's awesome. Good job. Thanks, man. man. Great, Thanks. Great producer. I, I love drummers that have great feel. Um, I do as well. I love drummers with, with chops, but... The best case scenario is when the those you know the, the Venn diagram intersects between those things, and you get drummers that have amazing skills, but that just yeah, just feels amazing when you hear them playing drums. And that's I mean Matt Halpin is one of those guys. Um, but there's so many, and and a lot of them are not necessarily even like big names, just like session guys or uh -huh. um, or people playing in bands that don't necessarily have huge amounts of commercial success, or guys that are playing in like gigantic pop acts and stuff and they're just holding down one beat on a loop yeah. for you know three and a half minutes and then the next song but that's not as easy as it sounds no. you know to be able to do that is a talent yeah There's and that's a, why they got the big pop gig <laughs> yeah yeah, absolutely. And yeah. There's there's one British session drummer called Ash Sone who's gotten a lot of Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, I know Ash? who that is. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's gotten a lot. He's become very kind of popular on Instagram because he posts a lot of things on there. But he's a, you know, he's done so many number one records and platinum records. And he's, he must be in his 50s, I reckon. Maybe even older, I'm not sure. I, I remember seeing in an interview with him where he said that he was playing, I think, on an Ad Adele track. And the the music director asked him to play like a kind of choppy fill, like a shreddy fill into the chorus and he was describing how mortified he was about it because he said that he'd spent his entire career trying to work out how to transition from a pre-chorus to a chorus with the minimum amount of distraction from the song and I thought that was such a cool quote and it obviously it stuck yeah. with me because I don't know why I remember it but you know he, he was talking about how he's been for his whole career trying to reduce the amount of fill and you know, not catch the listener's ear to the greatest extent, but still transition the song rhythmically in the way that it needs. And I thought that was so cool. It's like, you know, to it's think very of, cool. it's so different to the kinds of things you normally hear from musicians and, and what they're trying to do. It's like the complete opposite of showing off. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, that's music. It's listening. It's, yeah. um, and that's why he's doing well. You yeah. Know, it's important to be able to have that, uh, vision. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers I'm sure he's that. learned. I'm sure he's had producers telling him when he was very young, maybe like, Hey, stop playing so much, but it's something which he's obviously just taken on and has practiced for decades, you know, in some way or other. Has, has, uh, anyone told you that as a bass player? <laughs> uh, you, know, <laughs> you know what? I've, this is going to sound bizarre. I've never been produced as a bass player by somebody else. 
I've only oh, wow. ever played bass on productions that I've been the producer or maybe a, a record that doesn't have a kind of producer role and it's just I'm engineering like so many bands now work without someone who works as the producer you know the the bands define the songs you do a bit of pre-production but it's more just like everyone's equals in in deciding how the song goes and there isn't a kind of single producer figure so what about you, so you you've you must have done some really big really big kind of uh producer gigs I imagine I I've done some cool cool things um you know, it, it's, I've had experiences on, on both sides of the spectrum of, you know, oh, do your thing. No, you need more. You need, you need to do more. And then also uh, I need you to just basically not be noticed. Yeah. Just, I need you to fill a sub, a space. And um, so I appreciate each and every one of those experiences because it's taught me um, how to be a better musician, basically. Yeah. Um, but, uh, there was one more thing that I was going to ask you about. Um, oh, as far as, you know, um, bass players out there who are trying to create their voice because you had, you were able to, um, sort of find your voice as a producer and a bass player at the same time, Mm. which is awesome. You found your identity and you, you were able to shape it, um, um, as individually as uh, that's not even a word. What am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Basically as the producer and as the bass player, you were able to find your voice. It was easier for you. Can you recommend a way that people can go about that? Finding their voice as yeah. a player. It's interesting. I think I'm, I'm probably going to give like quite a kind of technical answer to this. Like quite a geeky uh, answer rather than kind throw of it out there. advice. Throw it out there. I think one thing which I appreciate about the world of bass is that different bass types, different pickup types, different settings really drastically affect the voice of the instrument. Like with guitars, if you've got five guitars and they all have like humbucking pickups on them, then they're, they're going to sound different. But if you put them all on the bridge pickup and play them through a distorted rig they're going to sound pretty similar. It's just the way it is. Like there's a lot more, um, I guess they're just all made within much smaller, like much more similar parameters, but you line up five different bases, even if they're dual humbucker bases or something like that. And all of them will have really distinct different voices. Um, and if they're multi pickup bases, then, you know, just playing with the, the kind of the blend pot between the, the neck and the bridge or whatever setup you've got, really kind of defines the mid-range like gives you like a different kind of like a more scoopy thing or a more kind of nasal thing or a more what i'm trying to say is there's just a huge amount that you can achieve that will be inherent in your bass sound from the bass if you mess around with those settings especially like the type of bass you play i think if it's got a sound that you like even unplugged you know that's going to be quite indicative of the kind of sound it's going to have through a rig um and then you know, the, the way that you then manipulate the controls. And if you do add, even if you don't like distortion, just a little bit, just a tiny bit, it can bring out the lovely harmonics that are already there just a bit more, make it sound a little bit more kind of piano like and have more overtones. And maybe in isolation, it might sound a little bit, you know, gritty or fuzzly or something, which maybe will seem a little bit unpleasant. I reckon that once you put it into context with other instruments, that's the bit that's going to give you the audible character and you're not going to perceive it as something bad. You're just going to notice more. It's it's like, it's like seasoning on a meal or something like that, you know, <laughs> adding salt, like salt on its own isn't the best thing in the world, but a little bit of salt to the right quantity on a, on a piece of meat or a vegetable or in a sauce is suddenly what makes all of that flavor come alive and, and allow you to really taste the flavor of an ingredient. So there you go. There's a chef analogy. For man, that. <laughs> man, I dig that. Yeah. I dig that. That's very good advice. Thanks. Um, where can people find you on social media and anywhere else? Um, yeah, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. I'm Nolly GGD on Instagram. Uh, GGD is get good drums. And I am Adam nolly get good and the nolly is in inverted commas on facebook um there's like a page <laughs> there 
to be honest, I'm not a huge user of social media. I, I use it sometimes to talk to people. The thing I do more than anything else is post my daily espresso shot on my Instagram story, which I, I which I've seen. Oh, yes. have you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just a personal record more it's just like it's just become part of my routine i barely anyone ever replies to it <laughs> you know what i mean, like, I mean um, people maybe in the beginning were like oh cool you're into coffee and then like after three months they're like oh it's another shot of coffee so it's not like it's something which is generating a huge reaction but it's something which i kind of just do as part of my daily routine so if you follow me that's probably the most the common thing you're going to see from me, but you are going to see you know, stuff about my, my bass products and my guitar products and drum products and musician stuff in general too. Well, as a coffee lover myself, I do appreciate that. So oh, I will wicked. continue to follow. And uh, next time I see one, I will send you a message to say, awesome, bro. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'll appreciate that. That will that will brighten up my morning. Dude. I really appreciate you doing this, man. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you and very informative. Thanks, man. It's been my, my, my real pleasure to be on. That is our show for today. Thank you all for joining us. Stay healthy and kind. Spread love, good vibes, and inspiration. And remember, you got this. Follow your path and just play. I'm Josh Paul. Hope to see you out there sometime soon. And thank you to Dunlop for making this show possible. Be sure to uh, check out Bass Freaks wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you very much and cheers. Nice.